Yeah, hello everybody and welcome to the fifth ocean forum here from German Ocean Foundation, Boot Düsseldorf and Foundation of Prince Albert II in Monaco. We are very happy that we have really 15 extraordinary speakers in 75 minutes. My name is Frank Schweikert from the German Ocean Foundation. A very warm welcome to all the participants. So to give you a short overview of um, about this program today, first we have a very speedy um, forum program with um, 15 speakers in 75 minutes. So please don't speak longer than five minutes. If you are much longer, then we shut down the program, not the program, your microphone, because we want to have very short slices of ocean ideas in this uh, forum. And then we will collect, and because this is an official project of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science, we collect some ideas how we, you, can contribute to the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And after this, it, this uh, would will be an experiment. We try to make the networking we couldn't do on the boat show in Düsseldorf. But uh, we are very happy that uh, Petros Michelidakis, who is the project director of boating and water sports of Messe Düsseldorf, is here and sent us welcome. Petros, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Frank, uh, to your and your team for this uh, perfect idea to have it uh, digitally instead of uh, being here in Düsseldorf. I think you all can imagine how much uh, my team and I and all people here at Messe Düsseldorf would have loved to welcome you here and having the program on stage and uh, yeah, seeing each other, talking to each other, hugging each other. Uh, we just can hope that it will come back soon. And uh, we are very confident that uh, we will run for Düsseldorf 2023 from the 21st January until the 29th. For this moment, I think the best thing we can do is to meet virtually. Uh, and of course, the best thing we can do is to go on caring about the climate change and about our oceans. And uh, the promise from our side is that despite the fact that Bodusudov didn't take place also this year, we will continue our fight, our support for you. And of course, we will do our best to find people who have beautiful ideas about the ocean protection program and um, the uh, climate change and this is something we will do also in the future with new ideas and I hope that next year we will have uh, the Blue Innovation Dog which is a beautiful program regarding sustainability and mobility on the water and uh, yeah I hope to see you all then have uh, a good year it's still not old enough so I can still wish you all the best and uh, enjoy the program which you have prepared with your team thank you very much and bye bye Thank you, Petros, for these warm words, for the greeting to all the participants. And um, from the biggest boat show in the world to the biggest program of ocean science in the world, the science we need for the ocean we want. This is the mission of the Ocean Decade, to catalyze transformative ocean science solutions for sustainable development, connecting people and our ocean. And I'm very delighted that Vladimir Yabinin, the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and the Assistant Director to UNESCO, is here to welcome us all. Vladimir, the floor is yours. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Frank. And you know, and this is still January, so let me uh, still wish you a happy new year. Uh, uh, and the Chinese year is ahead of us. Um, so, you know, I would like to say that indeed uh, what we are trying to do, all of us in different ways, is to change our human relations with the ocean towards uh, more harmony in them. You know, I'd like to quote from the um, Secretary General of United Nations, Antonio Guterres, who recently said that uh, humankind has to top suicidal war on mother nature. And I think this also has a very strong ocean dimension. And that is exactly the idea of the decade. You know, our world is becoming much more and more science intensive. 
and uh, this means uh, that we know uh, what is happening, that we also better know the solutions. We also uh, have more transparency in the world and those solutions and actions that are taken are more verifiable and are taken with more responsibility. And we would like really to, uh, to ensure uh, everyone that ocean science is capable of delivering the knowledge that is required to drive the solutions. It's not the first in, uh, time in history of humankind that is happening. I think similar situation happened in the uh, course of the decade on climate change. Uh, excuse me, debate, not the decade. You know, I'm used to, to words now. So, and you know, the debate on climate change and 2009 in conference in Copenhagen, when all the science was there, resulted basically in no decision. We would like to have actions of humankind. And uh, this is exactly why we are now, I think, uh, um, uh, bringing together the scientific knowledge that needs to be also transformed co-design in terms of uh, uh, involving uh, scientists involving end users, involving decision makers, involving um, uh, also young generation, early career ocean professionals. So co-design is, is the key element of uh, building the path to sustainable ocean. You know, and I think we also created uh, some movement that is not only moving forward in terms of uh, 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 technological developments. You know, indeed we have some high tech solutions, cutting edge science, but this is also quite quite uh, ethical and quite uh, quite uh, social in the sense because you know and, and under the 31 current programs of the decade we of course have uh, you know some modeling you have observations we have satellites everything but we also have uh, educate on uh, empathy in relation to the ocean and uh, so such human dimension is incredibly important. And this is exactly the lesson from the uh, social contract of climate science, only by bringing together the science, the knowledge and the good people and changing people, we can uh, achieve a lot. Yesterday, I actually opened a, a new toolkit for ocean literacy uh, that uh, we are going to start teaching uh, about the ocean as a part of education for sustainable development. And this is also a big change. So I think, uh, in in this sense, you know, I'd like to say, uh, first of all, let me quote the 2016 World Ocean Assessment that the humankind uh, it, it concluded that humankind was running out of time to start managing the ocean sustainably. And then that was to me uh, looking like basically a curse, uh, but the situation is changing. And I think we, we are able to change the situation uh, with regard to the ocean, uh, creating much better relations uh, through uh, leaving no one behind creating high-tech program and at the same time very human program. This is what is happening. And I think with that ocean, the uh, common heritage of, of humankind, actually Arvid Pardo who proposed this said, uh, common heritage of mankind, wrong. Now we live in, in the 21st century, common heritage of humankind. And with that, I think we'll be able to have effects that are spilling over the ocean to the relations between people, and the nature, and also between people and people. We were going to create a better world with the decade of ocean science. And I thank you for contributing to it. Thank you very much, Frank. Thanks very much, Vladimir. And thanks also um, to all your team supporting the relation between German Ocean Foundation and a lot of activities we will talk about later. And uh, thanks for the honor that you opened this uh, Ocean Forum and good luck for the decade and hope for good and uh, continuous collaboration. So um, now we would like to go to the program and the program we sliced into the seven goals of the Ocean Decade. And we are also very honored that we have um, with uh, Ronan Long, the director of the World Maritime University and the Global Ocean Institute of the World Maritime University in Malmö in Sweden. And um, he holds also the Nippon Foundation Chair of Ocean Governance in the Law of the Sea. And he wrote a lot of books and uh, many, many articles, but all what, uh, what is common for us here in this group is he's a big, big sailor like Boris Herrmann. So um, he will run an, uh, will give us an overview of what marine protection will the global community agree on. This is a very, very important issue, maybe the most important issue, uh, because it's dealing with marine biodiversity in areas beyond natural jurisdiction. And this is the, the BBNJ case. And Ronan, the floor is yours. And uh, we would love to have some insights. Yeah, look, Frank, uh, 
Uh, wonderful to see you and of course Petras. Uh, of course I, I would much prefer to be at Dusseldorf Boat Show as a sailor. Eh? So that's why I agreed to this and uh, I'm very struck as well by Vladimir's uh, comments. I've prepared a small presentation which will take maybe four or five minutes to, to walk through. So if I can share my screen, I can show you some slides. And, uh, okay, so the, the, the task Frank set me was to talk a little bit about marine uh, protection and what the global community is going to do this year on marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, the first thing I'd say is uh, we can only talk about the loss of biodiversity if we talk about climate change, over exploitation of resources and pollution of the marine environment. And I put particular emphasis on plastic pollution, as well as the human economic cost and indeed the social costs of the, the, the pandemic. My, my second point is really is that the, the impacts are very much focused on not only uh, developed countries such as Germany, but on developing countries across the global south for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the impacts are more severe. Uh, they have less capacity to adapt. Uh, it's exacerbating or compounding inequalities. It's threatening food security. It's manifesting in forced migration. We have urbanization right across the world. Yeah, you know, we've 10 cities in excess of 1 million people in Africa alone situated on the coast. And of course, developing countries have, shall we say, conflict between policy objectives and environmental objectives. Now, in the context of the pandemic, we, we, we know the road to recovery is far more difficult for the global south. Um, I, so I think right, we're thinking about over-exploitation of the resources of the sea, whether it's fish resources or the over-reliance on carbon intensive economies, or shall we say the, the development of global industries such as cruise industries or forced migration. What we're seeing at the other end of the scale is, is the natural environment is not able to sustain these pressures. So. If we come to the sustainable development goals, there's some very interesting research done by Will and Mary University in the United States, where they ranked at the goals on the basis of a survey of over 2000 uh, leaders in low and middle income countries. And they put the ocean at the bottom of their priorities of the 17 goals. Yeah? So the issues such as education, uh, economic growth, uh, human health and well-being at the top end. Now, if we go to the Pacific, and of course, sailors love to sail in the Pacific, we see the ocean rises on the, on the bottom, but it's very much close to the floor in terms of priorities. So it comes to the central question, which Frank asked me to answer, what are we doing about this? And I'm going to reference a very important process at the United Nations, which is the uh, conclusion of a new treaty on marine biodiversity, and it's focused on conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. There are four aspects to the treaty. Uh, marine genetic resources, and that's why the decade of ocean science is so important. It will provide a lot of the baseline information for the implementation of those uh, provisions. Likewise, in relation to the new measures on marine protected areas, as well as the measures on environmental impact assessment. Uh, but in this treaty, we're going to have a, a group of provisions addressing capacity building and the transfer of technology uh, to developing states. Uh, as we know, um, the areas beyond national jurisdiction, we generally refer to this as high seas, and that's two thirds of the ocean. And uh, now these opportunities for new treaties come up about every 25 years, once in a generation. And we're going to make a decision on this treaty at the United Nations in March. My final slide is uh, Christina Figueres came to talk to us as negotiators in 2017 and she led the climate change negotiations leading to the Paris Agreement and she gave us five tips and I think this is very good for the audience this afternoon and joining the Dusseldorf Boat Show. First and foremost, gloom and doom is not motivational and it's quite hard to forget about that. Secondly, we need an inspirational vision for the ocean and I think the ocean science decade delivers that. Uh, thirdly, we have to realize there are very different interests between governments and other stakeholders such as sailors. So, uh, 
That's why we need to reach out to the sailing community about biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And fourthly, and this goes back to us as humans, we've got to identify the self-interest. And lastly, we have to embrace complexity. And I'd say first and foremost, we have to embrace scientific complexity uh, because there's nothing simple about deep ocean science. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, Frank, and uh, I will be delighted to join the, the networking straight after the session. This is a picture of our university. Thank you very much. And I think that was exactly uh, five minutes. Thank you. Frank, du bist auf Sturm. Sorry, I was talking without my microphone. <laughs> yeah, exactly five minutes. Thank you for a great uh, presentation. And this um, was a good overview uh, what we need to um, work on, especially in this uh, small conference, especially on Love Your Ocean, the Love Your Ocean initiative. And I want to show that uh, we have the similar SDG Uh, ring in our jackets and I think these are the goals we we need to uh, work on the next years. Thanks so much to um, Sweden and now we come back to Germany to a very extraordinary person which is Andre Wilsig. He's one of our ambassadors and he was in August, the 21st of August 21, last year, the first person who swim from the German coast to the only German high sea island named Helgoland. He started in midnight in St. Peter Ording and uh, reached after 18 hours the 50 kilometer distance from the shore to this island. Andre, it's our pleasure to welcome you. and. <coughs> And uh, we are keen to listen to your uh, report how to swim 50 kilometers in the North Sea. Uh, thank you very much, but five minutes will not be long enough <laughs> to explain what I, sometimes I even don't understand by myself. Uh, yes, hello everybody, and um, I just want to ask you, I have a, my presentation, is this on, uh, on your computer? Or you want me to share my screen or? Because I send it the presentation over. Your screen, or I can I can start it for you as you like. Yes, please do so. <laughs> okay, I try. <laughs> yeah, so just to, to my person to to get a glimpse of, of what I'm doing. Um, I'm a very passionate, uh, like we all are here in this call in this ocean forum. Very passionate about our ocean and very passionate about uh, open ocean swimming. And um, as I'm a pretty normal person, I have a family with three kids. I have a regular job and um, this is just my side. And my side and my hobby is really doing these uh, open ocean swims. And um, can you switch to the next uh, slide, please, Katrin? And um, yes, I, I've done the Ocean 7 Challenge, which are the uh, seven most difficult open water swims in the world, um, very equal to the seven summits. You might have, have heard about that. This is the highest mountain on every continent and the open, the ocean seven are the, yeah, it's uh, on five continents. For example, there is the, 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 the legendary um, um, English Channel included, but also the North Channel between Northern Ireland and Scotland, the house. Cook Strait uh, between uh, so southern and the northern island of New Zealand, uh, on Hawaii, the, uh, the Molokai channel between the islands of Molokai and Oahu. And you have to know that um, you, don't, you swim under the same rules as the first person, uh, like Captain Webb, when, in 1875. So there are no wetsuits allowed. You're not allowed to touch the boat because, you, of course, you are not swimming just by yourself. You have an escort boat with you. Uh, doing all the navigation stuff because you normally swim at night and you swim together with all this marine wildlife. You meet sharks and you, you, of course I don't swim with a shark cage and stuff. And I was the 16th person in the world to achieve Ocean 7 and the first in the German speaking countries. And um, by this journey that has taken me over eight years, um, I finished the Ocean 7 Challenge uh, in uh, 2019. 
um, that is um, that comes along that you are you are you, you are a part of you become a part of the ocean. You you ref, you fuse with the element because I'm always swimming with the ocean, not against the ocean. And of course, I'm well prepared even for my next mission. Yes, Kaju, very nice. Can you click the? It's a short video that shows. Uh, what the swim's like it's not like you know going in a public pool or something you have you're swimming really in wild freaky <laughs> currents i was stuck in currents for hours um uh you have this uh, you have jellyfish and you have even this high very high swells which doesn't allow it to to fell into a rhythm it's it's a it's a different sport than pool swimming which was my uh, my my sport where i was coming from as a youngster I was was swimming, of course, but swimming like this. And as you can see me here, yeah, um, I'm not like looking like Florian Bellbrook or something. <laughs> of course, I can't keep up with him, and he looks different. But uh, he will be not successful, as he said to myself, under those conditions. And swimming under those conditions, where the where the ocean really happens, because far away from the beaches, this is where the ocean happens. This is what the ocean is and not along the coast um, uh, uh, where you just have the ocean normally as a, as a nice background for your holiday. Can you switch to the next one, Catherine, please? Um, yeah, that was my, my last swim, a very challenging one as well. Um, that was the swim from the mainland from Germany to the island, to the only offshore island we do have in Germany, Helgoland, and yeah, it's, was a total dis swimming distance of um, 53.4 K that day. And um, yeah, swimming there, uh, um, that was a pioneer, I was the first person to do this. And it's not, it's not about records. I'm not, um, it's, and it's not all about myself being a good swimmer. Uh, it, it's, it's a demonstration for the ocean because uh, um, I'm working as a speaker um, to, to, for public schools, for management classes, for universities, and showing the, this unique perspective and the things I met, I, I meet out, out there, like uh, the, the consequences of overfishing, because I've got, I've got stung by very poisonous jellyfish, uh, horrible and horrible situations. And uh, I'm stuck in currents in cause of this climate change we do have. We had had with my Helgoland swim, we did so much um, predictive analysis of the currents in the North Sea over seven over seven thousand um, uh, um, difficult uh, um, things we we like to figure out. But it, it went all it, 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 we were wrong by not knowing how the currents exactly uh, flow into the North Sea. And then the swim took me um, not as expected thirteen hours. It took me eighteen and a half hours in, in the North Sea. And yeah, of course, this is what I always, this is my, absolutely my, my opinion, my attitude that uh, we, and no matter if you're a sportsman, a family guy, uh, or you are working together in a team, you're always as good as the people behind you. So it's always a team effort. And it's great to achieve uh, things other people have always say uh, are impossible. And to make the impossible possible. And I always say that every, every unintended things are, remain impossible. So it's always good to go out there, do your best, and um, see how it how it goes, and tell people, of course. And um, can you switch over? And as um, I'm the, um, as Frank says, uh, as the ambassador of the German Ocean Foundation and also of, for the UN Ocean Decade, uh, together with Frank uh, Frank Otto, which is also the founder, next to Frank Schweikert of the Ocean German Ocean Foundation. Uh, there will be a new project coming up on the Seychelles um, as a demonstration for sustainability and even showing these people over there what the ocean really is. Because we, me, myself, and I think you as well, we love the ocean. And as anyone who loves from the heart will understand that there's a very normal consequence of love namely that you want to you want to protect your love and you want to preserve your love and the ocean you know, the oceans unite us all not only uh, that we as human beings are all descended from the oceans 
not only because we human beings are dependent on the oceans. The ocean knows no national borders, no countries, no religions, and it has, it has always been there and it will be there <laughs> long after we have gone. And um, I think uh, this thought and um, yeah, being out there, this always fills me with humility. Thanks you and, very um, much, and Andre. We are much over time now, and we need yeah, to keep the, the, the okay. concept that <laughs> all the other speakers uh, will be available. Thanks a lot, and a great deal to swim to Hagerland. Congratulations. Now we say good morning to Washington, D.C. Uh, the next speaker um, is uh, the outreach manager of the International Coastal Cleanup from Ocean Conservancy. This is Sarah Koller, and I'm very glad that we meet here, Sarah, because because Ocean Conservancy and the International Cleanup is the biggest uh, coastal cleanup in the world. And how many years do you uh, do this project until today, Sarah? Good morning. Good morning, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, we're going on the 37th year of the International Coastal Cleanup. Wow, great. So we are looking forward to hear some results from the last year cleanup. Sarah, it's you. Thank you, Frank, and thank you everyone for, for organizing this, this wonderful event and for inviting me to take part. Um, so I'm gonna quickly go through some slides as well. Hopefully you can see these. Um, I am with Ocean Conservancy. I am part of the Trash Free Seas Program. We are a nonprofit, non-government organization that's based in the United States. Um, but I do have the pleasure of, like Frank mentioned, I work very closely with our annual International Coastal Cleanup event, which um, as we just heard from that inspiring talk from Andre, is definitely a team event. Um, it spans many countries. Um, it's been going on for over three decades, and it's really just its global movement at this point. So um, traditionally, this does take place on or around the third Saturday in September. Um, so maybe perhaps you or, or someone you know have participated in a community organized event. Um, at Ocean Conservancy, we like to act as the glue to keep this force unified, um, to have a singular voice, to help our partners and different communities um, have these cleanups and, and make sure that they can happen, and to empower individuals to get out and do their own cleanup, um, especially now during the pandemic when we can't really do organized events. Um, but just a little bit of the impact of the, the International Coastal Cleanup globally, and then we'll shift over to um, the impact that has already taken place over the 25 plus years of international coastal cleanup in Germany. Um, and a few photos as well from, from more recent years. Uh, wonderful event, youth get involved, really volunteers of all ages. Um, and we're able to track this information because what we find that's unique about the international coastal cleanup from the beginning is that we've asked volunteers um, to not only remove this harmful marine debris um, and plastic pollution from their environment, inland waterways, as well as coasts, but we ask them to track the types and amount of debris that they find as well. So we've created a number of tools to uh, empower volunteers to do this. We have a paper data card in about 20 different languages, which we'll always still have um, as an option, but we are also very excited about an app that we've developed that basically puts the paper data card in the palm of your hand. That app is called Clean Swell. Um, Frank knows I could talk a whole hour just about the app um, and about the database where all of this information feeds. Um, but it, it does all go to um, an online open access system. So if anyone is curious, please feel free to reach out to me and I can share more about how this app works, um, how successful um, it has been. And of course, it's always with, with technology, it's, it's five years old, so it's already old and we're already doing a rebuild of the app to, to make it as, as user-friendly as possible. Um, but a really fantastic way to have volunteers around the world report their cleanup results and their impact in real time. And here's just a screenshot of uh, that database and the website URL there, if you are interested in learning a bit more about that. And we also publish the results as well. Uh, we like to keep an eye on trends. Um, I think this graphic that you see here, hopefully it's a little small, but we do like to report the top 10 items collected globally. Uh, in 2019, where these statistics came from, uh, food wrappers, uh, kind of plastic film type, uh, 
think of like a chip bag wrapper, um, those finally surpassed cigarette butts as the number one item collected globally. So it's been really fascinating to see um, these different, very common single use consumer items um, kind of rise and fall in this list um, as volunteers collect these important data, this com important community science data. We also, uh, we published this in a report, as I mentioned, and then this is where we also acknowledge the fantastic network of coordinators who, um, such as the, the German Ocean Foundation, really do make cleanups happen within their respective locations. Here's a little glimpse of the top items collected in Germany in just the last three years. The cleanup has persisted throughout the pandemic, just in smaller numbers. Um, and we've hopefully created some helpful tips and ways that volunteers can still uh, you know, clean safely. Um, and there's just an example there of some of the, the posters and very family-friendly and youth-friendly um, approachable tools that we have um, for folks to get involved in their river and coastal cleanups. And lastly, uh, we do uh, take the, the information collected, the stories from partners on the ground and the data collected by volunteers to create outreach and education materials as well. So I added just a little URL there if you're interested in, in learning more about that. And then we do get the question about tracking brands as well, different company or, or uh, manufacturer brands. And um, that's what that, it's hard to read, but we do have a brand survey um, data methodology as well, if, if others are interested in really diving uh, deep into the data collection process through community science. I think that is all for me. Hopefully I stayed within the five minutes and thank you very much for your time. Yeah, perfectly timed. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I hope you can participate in the network meeting afterwards. So if you, if there are any questions from the participants, uh, they are welcome after this uh, small, um, small speeches. So now we are looking to the sharks. No sharks, no healthy oceans. This is the passion of Niels Kluger, who is a shark conservation activist and a diving instructor. And uh, I think the day before yesterday war, war, was breaking news for all of us um, because we try to stop the finning uh, things in European Union. And uh, now the floor is free for Niels Kluger from Stop Finning EU campaign, no sharks, no healthy oceans. Yes, um, thank you, Frank. Um, and congratulations, Niels. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll come to that later. Um, we will take uh, any congrats uh, after 31st of January. And um, I don't know if you will present or if you want me to, to present. Maybe it's easier you present and if okay. something is... Uh, Destroyed, we take over. I'll, I'll be ready in a second. And my apologies uh, for having the slides in, in German, um, but I'll be talking English. So I hope everyone can follow us. Um, numbers are a bit old now um, on my slide. Um, right now, we have about 1.1 million EU citizens that have already voted for an end of shark fin trade in the EU. Um, today we have six days left um, to sign the EU citizens initiative. Um, and that's why we don't take congrats from now on because ECIs that have finished successfully before us um, told us that we have to consider about 20% of our votes to be invalid. So underage people that have tried fraud attempts stuff like that. So we're not there yet. We still need support um, and we consider ourselves to be through at around 1.2, 1.25 million. Then, then we should be safe. So still some work to do over the last days, uh, although everyone celebrated uh, because we had a really, really big push over the last month. End of December, we had roughly 500,000 votes. And then um, we got some support um, which pushed us beyond that, that 1 million barrier. Um, so yeah, please keep on supporting. Um, what, what, can I, what can I say about, about our, our initiative just quickly and I try to, to stick under the, under the five minutes. Um, from our perspective, and that's where it all started two years ago, there's mainly three reasons, and we will be happy to discuss that also with uh, experts from this groups. Um, 
to end shark fin trade. The first reason is that we have to condemn the currently legal shark um, fishing that is happening within the EU because um, obviously there are loopholes in the regulation, there are loopholes in fins naturally attached that, is, that are being used. Um, and we have to talk about how to, how to find barriers for that. And for us, the, the, the reasonable um, regulation would be to end shark fin trade. Um, the second part is, and we have proof for that um, in numerous vessels within the EU, that we still have illegal finning on board of EU vessels. It's still happening. We have very low observer rates out there. Um, we have cases of finning of, of uh, vessels under EU flags. So as long as sharks are valuable for their fins, finning will continue. As long as we're not stopping the trade of fins. And the third part is that in international shark fin cargoes, shark species are mixed very, very often. And this is very hard for customs to control if there's protected species in that cargo or not. The only way to do that is via a DNA analysis. And that's something that customs really rarely does because they have to hold the cargo for several days and if they don't find anything, it's going to be a costly thing. So there, for these three reasons, we decided to start this citizens initiative. And we still think that it is the right claim to ask the EU to finally end shark fin trade, because that's the only way shark fins cannot, uh, will not be valuable for fishermen anymore. And then the practice of finning and the legal overdoing in shark fishing will immediately stop because sharks are not valuable for their fins anymore. Um, what if we become the, come in these two years? And I just want to show that quickly to you and you're all invited to join in for the last days. Um, we're more than 100 NGOs and NPOs from as of now. Uh, I added 102, one and 102 just yesterday. Um, we have 11 water sports organizations. We have 13 bigger companies. Um, we have a bunch, a real bunch of influencers, photographers, um, sports uh, men. Um, we had um, tennis players out of the top 10 of the world joining um, the, the ECI. We had soccer players um, that are playing on, on Champions League level. We really had huge support um, among celebrities over the last weeks and months. And yeah, still we have 1 million EU citizens that have, that have already signed. Um, so please be invited to discuss with us. Um, I will uh, put in my, my email address into the chat right after uh, my speech. And please contact us if you have any comments on our initiative. Thanks for yeah. having me, Frank. And yes, thanks for this uh, presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big success, and uh, all of you, you can still join and sign this contribution, and we will talk later about this a bit more. So now, from uh, this uh, um, movement to save the sharks, we are very delighted to have uh, a really big ocean player from Germany here. Um, this is Sebastian Unger. He is le he leads the work in ocean governance at. Uh, the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. This institute was um, founded by Klaus Töpfer and he worked with Klaus Töpfer. He worked in the foreign uh, ministry and he has a background in biology and I'm very happy, Sebastian, that you could make it to be here today and to talk about ocean governance for sustainability in relation to a health and resilient ocean. Sebastian. Yeah, thanks a lot, Frank, uh, and thanks a lot for inviting me. And it's really a great honor to be on this very prestigious panel here and to, to see all these great ocean enthusiasts here this afternoon. So I will try to share my screen with you. Just bear with me for a second. I hope you can all see my screen. Excellent. Um, so I will um, jump straight into the topic and um, 
let's let's um, all remember how important the ocean really is to humankind. You know these figures, we have heard them today. The ocean covers 70 percent of the Earth's surface. It provides food, it provides climate regulation, it provides the foundation for human development and economic prosperity. And humankind and societies really depend on the different um, services provided by the ocean. And what we call ocean governance is really the way how societies interact with each other when taking decisions and agreeing and implementing steps for the conservation sustainable use for the ocean. And the ocean is already in a deep crisis. Um, more than 50% of the ocean is already impacted by man. There's basically no space in the ocean that is completely unimpacted. But still we see in the situation a further acceleration. This is also coined as blue acceleration. Basically all sectors of, of ocean use are growing, um, some of them exponentially, be it shipping, aquaculture, fisheries, you name it. The system we have set up as societies to deal with these different sectoral uses is quite fragmented. And this is really a way how we have put those uh, different organizations into a chart. Don't try to read all these acronyms, but see that each of these pillars stands for one sector of ocean use at the UN level. And these sectors don't speak with each other. And this is also continued when you go to the national level or sub-national level, level when you look at our ministries and our national administrations. In addition to that, we have a highly um, fragmented system also when it comes to the jurisdictional zones, starting from the territorial sea at our coast over the exclusive economic zones down to the high seas and the area that is the common heritage of mankind. Looking at species, and I uh, understand uh, Andre Wirzig has met some of these species uh, during his swims, they do not recognize these boundaries, and I heard some swimmers do neither. But these species, of course, require a different perspective, a different type of management than this sectoral divide that we have created as, as um, humanity. And you all know the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals set up by, by the UN. They provide a different perspective of how humanity is dealing with the ocean. That's our ocean goal, SDG 14, in conjunction with all the other goals, be it um, economic growth, be it, um, be it fighting hunger, be it um, climate change, sustainable um, economic development, etc. And these goals, and we have tried to really identify connections between those different goals, can only be achieved if they are progressed together. Such a vision of sustainable development, of course, is very difficult to achieve with such a fragmented system that I have shown you before. So we need to transform, we need to revise the way how we are governing the ocean. And there are processes underway. Um, Ronan has introduced in the first talk the BBNJ a discussion about creating a new global regime for the high seas. That's an important step to create this new vision for an integrated management. And we have coined together with other researchers something that is called the integrated ocean management. That's an approach that is really trying to foster sustainable use in ways that preserve marine ecosystems and improve livelihoods together that integrate and balance various ocean uses and environmental aspects. So moving away from looking sector by sector and that facilitate engagement of stakeholders and sectoral and cross-sectoral decision-making. Thank you very much. And I, I hope I also did not exceed too much my, my time budget. No, very much uh, very in, uh, in time, Sebastian. Thanks a lot for this great overview. And I hope we have a lot of uh, interfaces to cooperate in, in future with uh, your Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. I think this is a very important institute in, in the whole world um, um, puzzle. and. Um, Thanks for this. Now, coming from the um, from the challenges and maybe the problems of the whales to a solution-based thing, um, from a young German uh, entrepreneur, this is Sebastian Rakers. Um, he is the founder of um, Blue Biosciences, uh, based in Berlin, 
and uh, he makes salmon fillets from the lab. So also vegan people could eat fish in fruit in future probably. And Sebastian, we met a lot of times in uh, some conferences and I'm very happy that you succeed now with your startup in Berlin. And uh, we are looking forward to hear your presentation, how vegan people could eat fish in future. Thanks, Frank, and hopefully not only vegan people. So uh, we definitely approach much more people to eat uh, our product in the future, although it's still uh, a future uh, product. So we do not have yet uh, products available for the market. However, I'm very pleased to be amongst this amazing group of uh, ocean lovers. So I'm myself uh, a marine biologist and cell biologist by training myself. Uh, I have been working with the Fraunhofer Society for more than a decade and have been focusing on uh, fish cell biology and fish cell culturing. Um, before I actually founded uh, Blue Bioscience. Blue Bioscience is a startup uh, now the first actually in Europe uh, to create uh, food products. So fish products um, without using the animal itself, uh, but using the uh, fish cells as, as our resource. And why do we want to do it. I, I think Ronan uh, made a very nice presentation already talking about uh, the different challenges we are facing. But uh, to point it here again, so the current seafood production systems are still in peril and threatening our ecosystem. So we are talking about over exploitation, the loss of biodiversity. We have challenges due to the pollution um, and the environmental impact that fisheries uh, as well as global logistics on fish uh, products uh, provide on, on our ecosystems. But uh, moreover, we are also concerned about the cruelty. Uh, more than three trillion marine animals are slaughtered each year. And um, that's why we think, okay, we have to provide an alternative if we're capable to do so. At the same time, the pressure on our ocean is still growing and uh, the situation is very serious uh, as also the global seafood consumption itself exploded in the past decades. So fish and seafood are uh, the most important animal protein worldwide and three billion people are only relying on fish as their only source of uh, animal protein. However, demand is still surging. Since 1961, the global growth in fish consumption has doubled the population growth and uh, is even higher compared to all other animal protein types. And although aquaculture has uh, really uh, tried to, to keep the pace with fisheries and over uh, and is now producing more, even more worldwide than fisheries uh, uh, catch does, uh, still supply is failing. 170 countries still have substantial unmet demand for seafood. And as we all know, climate change even intensifies the situation. So that was more than a reason to me to uh, say, okay, I jump in from a pure researcher perspective into startup uh, to provide an alternative. And we see cultivated seafood, as we call it, as a big part of the solution. And some of you might know that the cellular agriculture uh, industry has been uh, growing over the last years. Uh, more than 80 uh, startups and companies have been um, working in, on that uh, part, mostly on the meat side. Uh, there are roughly uh, 10 companies worldwide uh, focusing on seafood. Um, and Blue is the first cultivated seafood company in Europe. Um, our three key elements are the nutritional value. Uh, of course, fish still is a very healthy um, food and um, uh, in, uh, including uh, healthy aspects, uh, components like uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, still, this, this is important for us to provide this nutritional value. At the same time, of course, we want to meet the taste uh, expectation of our future customers. So we focus directly on flavors, uh, texture, uh, mouthfeel, um, and we can do so because we do not only work from the cell culture side, but also on the food technology side already on our product. So we can directly um, work on different iterations of, uh, of our prototypes. 
And last but not least, we are market focused. So we aim to produce the most popular and demanded consumer products. So therefore, uh, in our portfolio, we have, for example, Atlantic Salmon as one of the most popular seafood products uh, uh, right now worldwide. But how does cultivated fish work at all? Uh, so in the beginning, we of course have to sacrifice one fish because we need to get access to the cells. And what we are using are adult stem cells. So stem cells uh, or stem cell populations that we are isolating and that we can expand afterwards because cell uh, stem cells have the capacity of uh, self-renewal over time. So this is our new uh, continuous resource for our products. And the good thing is uh, that very often these uh, stem cells immortalize spontaneously. So we do not have to apply any genetic modification to the cells. The cells simply start to grow continuously. And that's our, our uh, starting point. So after we uh, identified the cell lines, we have them for further growth. Um, and there comes one challenge. How can we grow cell lines um, in amounts that is industrial relevant? Um, so this is one challenge right now. We are still in the uh, research uh, R&D phase um, and uh, have to scale into industrial levels. So we are looking into different uh, bioreactor systems to be able to grow these cells at uh, lowest cost points and uh, very sustainable. In the end, we want to produce products like a nice fish fillet. So scaffolding is an important piece here as well. So cells have to uh, provide this nice um, muscle uh, tissue and therefore they need scaffolds because they are obligate adherent growing. And we need three different cell types. So muscle cells, fat cells and connective tissue that uh, glues everything together. In the end, of course, as I said, uh, taste, uh, texture is very important. So product development is then uh, the, the last point before uh, we finalize our products. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for this nice speech and for this uh, amazing uh, startup. Maybe you can discuss some of the things uh, later in the network uh, session. Definitely, and, we'll uh, love to. Good luck and maybe we have one day artificial crabs running around in our offices. Yeah, Thanks. from, <laughs> from uh, Sebastian going now to another issue and uh, we, I am very honored to have the, um, let's say the mastermind behind the new government party agreement to take out ammunition of German coasts. Um, I welcome Jan Wendt from Kiel. He's a digital ent entrepreneur and active in various national and international projects at the interface of business and research. And um, he's the master behind the ammunition clearance week in Kiel. And he's now reporting about how we could solve ammunition uh, debris in German coast, coastal waters. Jan, welcome. Thanks, Frank. Really nice introduction. But I think it's a team effort, so not just one person who, who made this possible. So it was a long, long run with many, many people. Um, I would like to tell you a bit about the issue of munition in the sea and about what is happening also on the political side and hopefully a future without munition in our in our oceans. Um, just a few words. Frank mentioned almost everything. So um, the most important part was um, that we initialized, uh, initialized in September last week, the first time the munition Week. So an international event with around 600 participants where we really had the chance here in, in Kiel to, to meet um, around 30 different nations participated and discussed the topic of munition on the sea on really a new, a new level. When we talk about munition in our oceans, so what are we actually talking about? Um, you can see here the map and that's what we are doing. We are a software development um, a company and it's one of our environmental related projects is mapping actually the issue of munition in our oceans. And you can see here already on the map um, what munition in our oceans um, uh, means. It's not just simply a German issue that we have. Um, it's a worldwide issue. You can see in Australia, Japan, the States actually dumped until the mid seventies munition in, in the oceans. So it's something a quite large scale, um, big issue. How did munition end up in our oceans? So there are for sure numerous wars have been fought, uh, fought uh, especially in our coastal areas. 
Um, the first, but especially the second war, provided a full new dimension of uh, stress regarding the topic of munition in our oceans. So there are various pathways. One is for sure naval warfare, so really fights. The other one is naval um, and military exercises, but the uh, biggest problem was the munition dumping after the Second World War. So there was such a large amount of ammunition available um, and no one knew really what to do with it. And the easiest way was just simply load it on ships and yeah, an industrial way to dump it. And I brought a short video, which gives you a little impression about the industrial scale of uh, dumping um, munitions. You can see here the loading um, of the ships in one uh, operation, the David Jones locker operation. And you can see here really nicely how industrialized the whole process of munition uh, dumping was. So really large amounts which entered actually our, our environment. So at this time, for sure, it was the easiest way of getting rid of ammunition. Um, now, for sure, we see what kind of consequences we are facing um, based on, on the actions that were carried out there. So what are we talking about? How much munition is actually in our oceans. Um, simply spoken, we really don't know. We have rough estimates based on mostly historic um, information. So in Germany, um, you can see a small map of the Baltic and the German North Sea area. We're talking probably around 1.6 million tons, which is equivalent to a freight train of a length of two and a half thousand kilometers full of ammunition, which entered our, our just German, German waters. In total over the Baltic Sea, not clear numbers, but um, there are estimates of around 600,000 tons in the Baltic. So you can see already that in our German North Sea, there's the big amount of 1.3 million. Chemical munition, that's also, we're talking, uh, distinguish between chemical munition and conventional munition, so explosives. Chemical munition, our oceans 40,000 tons with a large amount at the Bonholm Deep. And just to give you another number, just simply drop mines during the Second World War in our Baltic Sea around 100,000. That's how it looks. That's a picture the Geomar took with an autonomous underwater vehicle. Um, I think we saw it nicely in the video, all the small boxes which were dumped. This is a picture of Lübeck Bay. So that's how it looks in, in Lübeck Bay in, in parts. Um, another picture which we have here from Kolberger Heide, um, a nice uh, place in quite in close vicinity uh, to Kiel. So here you have a quite broad variety um, of ground mines, of anchorage mines, of openly lying uh, at TNT, here in this case probably Schiesvolle. Some other nice pictures took by Jana Ulrich, by Diver, so a British ground mine, um, quite good conditions if you say like this. Um, another anchorage mine, which is heavily uh, rusted, um, and here this open line TNT, which we just had from the aerial perspective. So coming to the new government and better perspectives, um, Frank already mentioned that um, with the new government also changes uh, came uh, into the game here in the topic of munition in our oceans. Um, the coalition agreement is really stating the topic of munition in the sea and it's stating that we will carry out some kind of immediate program of starting um, the clearance operations and some kind of medium and long-term financing mechanisms to get rid of the munition in our oceans. And especially our new uh, Minister of, of Environment, Steffi Lemke, she's heavily pushing this topic forward. Um, so the political will is finally there. It took, um, yeah, I think the group of the people who were in, in enforcing this already the last 10 years to come to this point, but we really brought it into the coalition agreement with more or less fixed financial um, statements from the new government, which is an extremely big step forward. Um, so now bring the whole game into play. So it will take time. Yeah? So we are talking about um, really long time to get rid of the munition or oceans. Here's some of the kind of first drafts what we are facing. Um, so for example, Tussen Group is one um, of the companies who are developing concepts. So we're talking about industrial scale removal of munition in our oceans. And I think this is the challenge that will come in the next uh, weeks and months and years uh, to overcome this issue and hopefully to clear our oceans from ammunition. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jan. This is a really amazing work, working on a safe ocean. 
And uh, this is also one of the very important goals of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Much luck and uh, I hope that the politicians will do what they wrote down in the contract for the government. So next uh, is an accessible ocean, which is also one of the goals of the decade. And um, we can only manage what we can see and measure. This is uh, from Hannah Brocker. She's co-founder and COO of the Bremen Bay Start Plan Blue uh, startup, uh, which uses a novel technology to monitor the seabed. It's a, I, I think it's a mixture of cameras and sensors. And this is very amazing to detect corals, plastic waste among corals and plants and uh, can be distinguished with a camera system. Anna, we are very looking forward to hear your um, talk uh, about your project and uh, your camera system. Maybe this could be a very good solution for monitoring in the future. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, much uh, Frank. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm very happy to be here today. So I'll share my screen. Hmm. Is it working? Because all of a sudden I don't see you anymore. Yes, it's, it's perfect. Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. So um, nowadays, this is a quite amazing what we can do. Uh, we can zoom in in any place on earth, in, uh, on land, in highest detail. And for example, oh, uh, oops. And for example, um, this is where we're supposed to uh, be today, the Messe Düsseldorf. You can zoom in and you can see um, people walking uh, along the Rhine or they're chilling on the sand. And we can even go so far that we can see how um, the road is uh, changing in millimeter scale uh, over a period of the day. But what we cannot see, we cannot look into uh, wherever there is water. We cannot see uh, the floor of Rhine, uh, of the Rhine here. But if you think about our planet, we're talking about two uh, thirds uh, of the area of our planet. And this is, of course, really problematic. If you think about how dependent we are ecologically and economically, and of course, what we also mentioned with all the global threats we're facing with pollution, biodiversity loss, climate change. And what we want to do in Plan Blue is to really fill this data gap. But before um, I, I show you what, what we uh, developed, I would like to go a back uh, a step and tell you why seafloor data we feel is so, so very important and also key to uh, tackle uh, our global problems. So first of all, the seafloor mirrors the health uh, of the ocean above. And also uh, almost all marine lives are dependent on directly on the seafloor, but also for us as a livelihood, and we heard that already beforehand, like it's a food source, it's a job provider for billions of people. It's a really large economy from 2.5 trillion per year, but this is also a climate uh, regulator. <clears throat> for example, the seafloor is the best carbon sequencer we know on Earth. So the seafloor can capture CO2 20 to 40 times more efficient than on land. We need to have like a monitoring technology showing how much carbon we can capture that we can enable an entire industry and fix tons of CO2. Another example is, and, uh, is that the ocean means hope to provide enough food for the future. So the EU puts quite a lot of funds into that. However, we are really well aware that uh, aquaculture is in many places a threat to uh, the ecosystems. But why can we not regulate it? Why can we not put it in guidelines and frameworks? Because we lack on a standardized way to monitor the seafloor. Imagine we have those kind of data, we could uh, implement uh, also a legal framework saying this is allowed 500,000 meters, 3,000 meters away from your aquaculture. That is, would encourage innovation, which is already there for this kind of industry. 
So as I mentioned already, satellites cannot capture this kind of um, data. And that's why we develop an underwater satellite. So we combine advanced imaging from satellite technology, actually, artificial intelligence and underwater navigation. And what we want to do is fill the gap and pop up the seafloor in high details. And what do I mean? Not the topography, no. I mean biodiversity and materials. So also when we do those, uh, when we create those maps, we can highlight features which are applicable for multiple use cases. So here's a very simple one. There's much more uh, we can do. Here in red is plastic in this example and in um, beige um, sedimentation. So I brought you another example where we screened the seagrass meadow and we can show uh, the health status of the seagrass and hopefully in a very close uh, future also how much carbon can be captured. There's so much we can do with this kind of data for the management because we can make things visual which are not visual and give tools for uh, management and for other industry to, um, yeah, to, to, uh, use this value of the data. So here you can see um, the dive operated version of our underwater satellite. But this year, we are really happy uh, that we can um, start uh, putting our technology on autonomous vehicles. And yeah, thank you very much. I'm very happy to talk more about the technology and uh, it's very amazing people here and I really enjoy to be part and also be a listener here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Hannah. And this is really amazing technology. And I, I look forward that you can use it on our small research vessel. And uh, you mentioned the seagrass. Uh, we will also focus on this ecosystem. I think this is very, very important. And thank you for highlighting this. Now, coming from an, uh, from an accessible ocean, which was the item of Hannah, to an inspiring ocean. And I'm very happy that uh, we also have a guest from you again from the United States. Sky Moret, she believes in the power of visualization and meaningful engagement in bridging the gap between design and science. She is a sailor, she is a scientist, and she is an artist. And uh, Sky, we met in Brussels uh, um, a long time ago, and I'm really um, happy to see your art and your cooperations worldwide and uh, you are also working for TBA 21. So we are looking forward for what you are doing for an inspiring ocean with your projects. The floor is yours. Great, thank you, Frank. Um, so, so lovely to receive this invitation. Uh, I just want to briefly speak to you about a few projects I've completed over the last uh, six, seven years or so um, that really highlights uh, what, um, you know, how we can engage people in a way that doesn't involve scientific papers or white papers that a lot of people, you know, won't end up reading. So, um, again, I sailed for 100,000 miles at sea teaching undergraduates oceanography at sea, um, working for the U.S. Antarctic program down on the icy continent. Um, and, you know, really thinking about what questions do people ask me when I return? Um, people are really excited about that experiential engagement, um, whether I'm talking about plastic in the ocean, uh, which I ended up studying for a, for a, a long time, um, to, you know, what do you see, what's the ocean really like? Um, that is really what tends to engage people, um, including, you know, what is, what is Antarctica like? What is the Southern Ocean like? And I went through the academic process of writing many papers about plastic in the ocean, kind of what is it, um, you know, how does wind affect it, how much is in the Atlantic, how much is in the Pacific, what size is it. We made a, a documentary about 10 years ago now. And all these scientific graphics are great, but they're very scientifically focused. They're domain experts. Um, kind of, you know, exchanging information is very domain specific. It's for experts, it's not for lay people and the public who want to engage and understand this kind of information. And so um, that leads to this very different perspective of a the idea of a garbage patch, you know, the size of a small country versus these tiny little pieces, which is make up most of the plastic in the ocean. And so funded by the National Geographic Ocean Plastic Innovation Challenge, um, two uh, colleagues, both Germans, Moritz, Moritz Stefaner and uh, Lena Klaus, 
uh, we went um, and did this amazing project in Bali, uh, visualizing the fate of all plastic ever made on Earth, which was uh, from a scientific publication in 2017. Um, and we did this uh, 14 meter diameter data art installation, a kind of data visceralization, looking at of all the plastic created on the planet um, from 1950 to 2015 or 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic, how much has been discarded just in landfills, sometimes it's mismanaged waste that ends up in the ocean, how much has been recycled, um, burned or incinerated, and then how much is still in use. And of course, this number is much bigger now, it's over 9 billion tons. Um, but the sheer idea of taking a proprietary scientific visualization in an academic journal and, and transitioning it um, into something that's a, you know, more visceral, um, that includes, you know, volunteer cleanups, taking trash from these beaches, and just um, visually forming them in a way that is more tangible and understandable. Um, you know, somewhat beautiful, uh, paradoxically, and um, of course, the community dynamics of doing a project like this that is data focused, also art focused, also community focused is really exciting. And so I'll show you one more project. Um, as you know, I went to Antarctica quite a bit, um, working, uh, facilitating marine science. Um, and, you know, when you Google Antarctica, this is what you get, you get these beautiful blue days, um, you everything is above the surface of the ocean <laughs> even though antarctica is 100 percent the ecosystem is grounded in the marine environment and the amazing biodiversity below the surface and i knew from um doing all these scientific uh trips at sea that underwater you get these amazing array of colors i would pull up you know man-sized giant yellow sponges and giant purple sea stars and and rays and octopuses and um, so what was exciting is um, a few years ago, published in Popular Science, I, I took 50 photographs from above the surface, 50 photographs from below, and I just visualized them in these, um, uh, just kind of abstracted the images, just took out the colors so that you can see this, the sea surface threshold and just look at um, the lack of color kind of above the ocean and use this idea of color as a biodiversity proxy. Um, I made it into a gestural interface, which is how I met Frank. We were, I was at the U in Brussels, um, kind of a way to actually explore these different color bars. And um, I guess I just wanted to end on the fact that, you know, these kinds of engagements of, of not trying to be too didactic and too teachy, but, you know, harness color or, um, you know, texture um, engagement uh, in real life is, is, has, has proved to be much more um, enriching in terms of engaging people and the public with the ocean than I had ever expected. Um, so I'm happy to speak later. It looks like I can't go back, <laughs> but thank you. And yeah. Thank you, Sky. This is a really amazing work, bridging the gap, and a really uh, good example of an, for an inspiring ocean. And I hope we see an ocean festival in Berlin this year. We will organize a big screen for you, and then we can uh, uh, digitize and visualize what you did already. Thanks a lot. So um, now coming to someone who looked like me during his childhood to the adventures of the Calypso featuring Jacques Cousteau as a captain. And uh, welcome Tobias Friedrich, who is one of the most successful underwater photographers in the last uh, 50 contests. He made 30 first places with overwhelming um, images. And uh, I would love to see some um, some experiences from you now and thank you to support also our work on the German Ocean Foundation. Tobias Friedrich, the floor is yours. Hello and uh, thank you very much. I hope everybody can understand me correctly. Um, I'm also trying to share my uh, screen now and I can't see everybody else in that moment anymore. So just give me a short confirmation please if you can see my screen, yeah? We can see you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, um, uh, actually, this was a topic from uh, the boat show, uh, which I should have given on the on the boat show. It's uh, translated until the last herring orcas in Norway, and uh, it's a bit different, I think, than all the other presentations we have seen so far, which were super interesting in my eyes. And uh, but more, I'm of, I'm an underwater photographer. Uh, full-time underwater photographer and um, uh, my uh, presentation is a bit more 
more about natural history and of course about the orcas in Norway. You might have heard about that, uh, that the orcas every winter are coming to northern Norway. That means to the area around about Tromsø, yeah, I would say a few, a few hundred kilometers north and south of that. And they are coming there because of the tons of herring, of the mid-Atlantic herring that is going to um, overwinter, so to say, in the fjords of Norway. Um, they're not doing anything, the herring there, but um, they are getting hunted um, by orcas and also by um, humpback whales and some other different uh, types of whales and hunters. But the orcas are the main thing there. Um, they have been there uh, like 20, 30 years ago in the Tusfjord, but they are changing um, after the herring. So it's a bit difficult actually um, to go there and to see where they are exactly. So it seems that every 10, 15 years they're changing, the herring is changing there over wintering ground. So are the orcas as well. And uh, the problem for a photographer in uh, Norway is that the sun is only coming out uh, maybe um, for four or five hours and during a day, but it also means that it's not coming out above the horizon. Uh, most of the times you see the sun like this, uh, that means it doesn't even go above the uh, mountains. So um, the light is super, super low and um, it doesn't even go, as I said, above the mountains. So the water is even uh, more dark, even almost pitch black, and you only have a few hours actually to find and to see the um, orcas in Norway. And also the problem is it's the North Atlantic. Um, so it's always uh, a lot of storm, a lot of snow, uh, very cold conditions there. So it's not so easy to see the orcas and also not so good uh, for the equipment. And um, this is a pretty uh, ordinary image, but it's maybe the last image of uh, my drone I had uh, brand new there in that moment. And uh, the battery uh, found after one minute of flight, it was too cold. And uh, so it, uh, the drone just landed in the sea. Uh, that means in the waves. And uh, so it's a little bit uh, equipment heavy, um, I would say. And this is not a photo of the equipment I had with me in Norway but what broke in Norway. Uh, so, <laughs> so if you're going to Norway to see the, the orcas and if you want to photograph them, so just be prepared that uh, some of the equipment might fail or uh, even breaks. Um, but this is also part of being an underwater or nature photographer and to calculate that in. And of course, um, I mean, there are orcas in Norway uh, and I've been there already five times um, to see um, the orcas, sometimes for two weeks, sometimes only for one week. Last time I've been there, last November, and uh, I haven't seen an orca underwater because um, the conditions were so bad that we couldn't see any orcas underwater. Above water, it was okay, but still, yeah. So this is just a short wrap up of what, I, what I've done in the past years as well. So a summary of all the pictures. And this was during one of the trips where we were a bit more lucky, I have to say, to see orcas underwater. And I was photographed but after a few minutes of photographing, I saw that uh, this is actually a photo also of my camera that some that my housing was actually leaking um, and I had to uh, postpone the dive and uh, to stop it uh, for the whole journey. So it's uh, definitely not easy to photograph these um, orcas in Norway. So for four um, or five times now, um, I've been there and tried to photograph actually orcas uh, hunting herring in Norway. And of course, from here and there, I, um, I had the chance to see orcas underwater passing, uh, but never um, really hunting underwater for the herring. And this is, of course, what I wanted as a nature photographer. And on the last uh, day of the fourth trip, um, we had uh, we were really lucky and saw a lot of birds on the surface, which means also there's a bait ball most likely underwater. And after one hour of searching for that bait ball, we finally found it and also saw some orcas finally hunting for some herring. And um, I'm really a passionate underwater photographer. And um, I really, really love to show photos. But in this time, I uh, switched to my video because the hunting of the orcas is just incredible. Yeah. So this is an eight meter or uh, male orca and they are slapping their tail fin through this bait ball of herrings 
to stun them, to stun the herring, and then they just made a 180 degree turn and uh, just snap it um, from the like the stunned herring from the from the um, uh, from the water. Yeah. So this is how they hunt. The orcas are hunting different to where they are and which population they are. Um, so they are uh, mammal hunters, they are fish hunters, they are different populations in the Arctic, of course. These are, of course, of course, fish hunters and they are specialized in hunting, uh, hunting herring here with this method. And I think it's absolutely fascinating and amazing um, how they do it. And they are so, they're the most intelligent uh, animals, so what I, what I know. Uh, in the in the oceans, and they have the most complex uh, fighting strategies in the uh, in the nature. So um, this made for me the orcas uh, so fascinating, and it was unbelievable and a big honor to be part there and uh, just to watch them see um, hunting the the herring. Yeah? Um, I hope you can see that uh, correctly in the stream. I was not able to see the stream um, so good in the past videos. Um, but I hope it's also available um, afterwards. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's going on a little bit more the um, the video, and I want to thank you um, as well again for being um, part here of the of this honorable group and this panel. And um, I wanted to say that I'm while these pictures are running that I'm started to take pictures about 20 years ago underwater to show my family and my friends how beautiful the underwater landscapes are and the and the reefs and the animals and this is actually still um, maybe the most reason uh, why I'm doing underwater photography is just to show the beauty of the oceans and to transport that message to the world and I hope that this is really helping for everybody um, who's maybe not so firm with the with this um, environment to also see that this is so um, important to save and uh, the oceans and to save this um, especially environment like everybody in this panel is uh, doing I'm sure yeah so um, yeah thank you very much um, for for listening I think the video is running for a few more seconds um, but not long and uh, yeah um wish you all uh, a really nice evening to uh, the rest of the world yeah thank you <laughs> to you can follow me on my website yeah. and if you want to if you haven't to and uh, yeah this, for um, sure we will follow you this is amazing images and thank you a lot for this really great work and uh, so as an inspiring ocean this is a very very important uh, issue for the un decade for ocean science for uh, sustainable development and now we are coming to a prize to an ocean prize this is the ocean tribute award which is uh, was founded by german ocean foundation the boat in Düsseldorf, and the uh, foundation of prince albert ii and um, we have the honor to um, nominate every year one winner and uh, we will make normally we make this uh, award um, ceremonies on ocho but now we plan to do it in some weeks. So in uh, the next days, you will get some information when we announce the winner of this year. And I'm now happy to switch to this, to South America, where we uh, welcome the winner from last year, which is Gabriela Gomez from Equilibrio Mag Magazine. And um, first of all, congratulations to the Ocean Tribute Award last year. And maybe, uh, Gabriela, you can talk a bit about your magazine and how you make environmental ocean communication in Brazil. Welcome to the Hello, Brian. Thanks here. for the introduction. We're all the way uh, in, in Mexico. So uh, it's pretty ah, tough to you all <laughs> from Mexico. We're super uh, happy that we won this Ocean Tribute Award in the 2021. So uh, we were the winners last year. And I have a presentation here that I'd like to share with you. I'll tell you a little bit more about Equilibrio. And um, here we go. So this is the cover for last year that was published just last week. And uh, this is a photograph that you that was taken recently uh, in, in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, so we're an NGO that's dedicated to conservation. 
And the Equilibrio is a project of ours that we are very proud of because we really believe that um, communication is also a way of doing conservation. And so we've been publishing this magazine since, since 2008. And because of the Ocean Tribute Award, we're more than a magazine now. We're focusing on building a new platform and you will be able to see us at equilibrio.org.mx. We've been publishing this uh, magazine for the last 20 years alongside the very famous newspaper here in Mexico called Reforma. And uh, we're really just a group of people who are enthusiasts of, the, of nature and conservation. And uh, here, here you can see some images of, the, of this current issue. We, every time we print the magazine, we have around 40,000 copies distributed. We distribute them, like I said, in, in the Reforma newspaper, but we also distribute them in special events and uh, among other key places like universities. Uh, we, we distribute it as well among the indigenous and fishing communities because we believe that they have to be informed of what a treasure they have and how thankful they should be for the resources they can find in the ocean. Uh, we also distributed among a government institutions and special events, airport lounges and Mexican airlines, uh, key hotels uh, that are important for conservation tourism, specialized tours, marinas, and other relevant restaurants. What we believe is that we should promote the protection of nature, get conservation news and issues on people's minds, give a space for specialists to express their knowledge and their own voice, raise awareness on the main conservation matters and be effective in making a call to action. What we want is to promote real change. So we're very passionate about our, our magazine. This is a little video of uh, when we were told that we were the winners. And I'll just want to share it with you because it was a very exciting moment Why for us. one of you to Düsseldorf in 2022 to get it by yourself. You are the winner of the what? Ocean Tribute Award in 2021. And we hope we can contribute a bit with the 20,000 euro you also won. <laughs> Why one of you to so, Düsseldorf in 2022 to get it by yourself. You are the... So with this 20,000 euros, we were able to... to get together this new issue and uh, to print it. We'll make sure to be sending some copies to Germany uh, during this week. And uh, also to get our platform running because the world is changing as we know. Um, the, and even people in small communities, they also go online and search for more, in, more news and, uh, and content online. And even though, there's some communities that we know can't really reach the online platform and that's where we want to get them the printed magazines we also want to get this news out to every corner of our country and the world and so we've been working lately on well for the last three or four years on on building for momentum to push for a new mpa marine protected area in the Sea of Cortez, which we called Sea of Cortez and South Baja California Pacific Biosphere Reserve. We managed in our NGO Beta Diversidad to get the proclamation for Revilla Gijedo, which is south of, of the Baja Penins, uh, the Baja Peninsula. And right now, Revilla Gijedo is the biggest MPA in all of North America. So we're very proud to have been at the forefront of that project. And now we're looking to build uh, the momentum and the policies and uh, for, for necessary to, to make more marine protected areas in, in a region. And, uh, and I just wanna say that with this new issue, we've been able to print over 11,000 copies, both in English and Spanish. And we even got, uh, uh, we did a little contestment with children to promote education, marine ed education throughout schools. And we published their contest in our, in our last page in the magazine in this current issue. 
And we have, we're really, really proud of the collaborations we managed to put together in this issue. We have collaboration of coastal fishermen. We got, we interviewed them, many of them, and uh, put their input in our magazine in the first few pages. We also have a, an amazing article by Adam's colleague called A Devotee of the Ocean. He tells his story of how he got engaged with the ocean and how he's so passionate about it and conserving it. We also have a collaboration by Michael Fishback and Sean Hendricks. Michael is a great scientist, possibly one of the most uh, involved scientists in the world with blue whales. And uh, we also have a collaboration by one of our sponsors, Donna Retaily, which we are really thankful to have in our, in our magazine, in our last issue. Another one by Matt Brand from Pew, Berterell, from Pew Trust Funds called Marine Protector Areas. And we also included one from our partner NGO called Orcas. They're a group of women, all of them uh, working in, in conservation projects. They're specifically working on a chart project right now in Baja California. So you can actually go to the magazine and read a little bit about them and what they're doing and the work they're doing with orcas on this side of the ocean. And, uh, and also a great one from Sebastian Nichols talking about high seas protection. And I just wanna show you in this next slide, a little bit of the content we put together in this last issue. And so we're super thankful to have won the award and we look forward to collaborating more with the international community and there's just one ocean and we're all connected and we're super happy to get this news and all of these great voices out there for everyone to see. Thank you very much, Gabriela. And we are very happy to see these results of your stunning work and uh, keep going to do things like this because um, ocean literacy is so, so important to bridge the gap between the oceans and the humans because uh, we only have one ocean. Thanks so much and congratulations again uh, for the Ocean Tribute Award. And whenever you come to Germany or we come with the boat to, to Mexico, we should connect and try to make a project. You're all welcome and we'll give you a tour in the Sea of Cortez when you'll never forget. <laughs> Thanks so much and uh, that was a short uh, overview about uh, very important uh, marine issues under the umbrella of the U United Nations Decade for Ocean Science of, uh, for Sustainable Development. And last but not least, I, I personally like to give you an overview what we are planning here in Germany and let me uh, share my screen. So. <clears throat> Um, I will go roughly through the agenda of the German Ocean Foundation societal activities of this decade. So until today, we have endorsed seven projects. Um, I will show you now. Uh, one project is the Love Your Ocean Initiative, uh, which this um, ocean um, this ocean forum is one part of it. It's a mixture of economics, science and society. And because we cannot do it uh, real in, in Dusseldorf, we have everything online from today. Thanks to all my team also under the project management of MUNA to put all these um, interesting ideas on this website and whenever you have more content for us um, go to the website oceandecade.org in German letters written love your ocean or write an email to uh, Muna and uh, then we could put your project here on this common website. We plan to do a permanent exhibition on a big museum ship in Cap, Sa Cap San Diego uh, in the middle of Hamburg, which is really nice. And we hope that Corona pandemics end somehow. And uh, in springtime, maybe around the day of the ocean in uh, June, we can open um, the exhibition with more than 30 or 40 different partners. Um, then we are happy to make the National Youth Contest Research at Sea. Um, last year, we have interesting projects about ammunition dumpings, uh, alter an alternative plastic film, um, and all the videos and all the projects you can see uh, on the website. As well, we are working on the acoustics of offshore tur wind turbines 
if they hurt uh, mammals or not. And we are, were looking to oxygen minimum zones in the near coastal area. Um, yesterday, we had the final colloquium of this uh, uh, youth contest and uh, we have really nice winners. And if you want to participate, um, you should send your proposal. If you are from the ninth class on, uh, send the proposal until the 30th of March to us and then you can participate with a small team on our research vessel Aldebaran, which is working now since 30 years also on the Mexican coast. Uh, also in the Central American area, but uh, mainly in the Baltic and North Sea coast for research, sailing, education, communication and diving. Yeah, so this is again the um, deadline for the National Youth Contest, 31st of March 22. And um, then the excursions are in the summer, in July and August, and the final colloquium is on the boat show in Düsseldorf, hopefully next year um, with personal presence. Then, uh, and all of you are really invited also uh, from all over the world to come to our Ocean Festival in Berlin, because now in our in the contract of the new parties of the German government, we have uh, a lot of oh, we have one page for the oceans, and we are very happy that uh, probably the new government will be very open for more ocean conservancy, for ocean science, etc. And on Potsdam Place, we would like to show arts and culture, science and education. Um, green products, blue economy, so blue, welcome, then we can taste the artificial grapes or the, the salmon and interaction and conservation. Then uh, we have this UMARES conference under the umbrella of the German Society for Marine Research. Um, was a, a hybrid hybrid conference last year and uh, next year, or no, next year, this year, in October 4th to 7th, uh, this UMARES conference will take place in Berlin. Last year, more than 250 particip participants were there. And then we are working on a very interesting thing Maybe some of you could help us with this. Um, there are a lot of um, articles, approximately 300,000 uh, articles and books and chapters on the subject ocean from Springer Nature, which is one of the uh, scientific publishing houses here in Germany. And together with the uh, German Society for Marine Research and the uh, Biologists Association, we want to uh, use artificial intelligence to bridge the gap between this uh, very difficult and uh, complex chapters with and share it with non-scientists, political decision makers and journalists. Um, and then we have an, op an ocean conference series, uh, which we are working on the concept and all of you are invited as well as a citizen science project. Uh, we are talking to Paddy Aware Foundation to ask uh, divers all over the world to contribute with their personal data for a citizen science project session. We want to thank to all the contributors um, to this activity, especially the Deutsche Postcode Lottery and uh, the team of the German Ocean Foundation and the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science team and um, to Boot Düsseldorf. And um, then we continue this communication monthly um, and we have the, the dates for this uh, regularly joint activities on the website Ocean Decade. So the next is on the 17th of March, 14th of April. And we, all, um, we always talk about the upcoming projects here in Germany. 